Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, Senate occasional lecture. My name is Jackie Morris. I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure in uh, the Department of the Senate. In welcoming you, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and acknowledge their elders past and present. The international community recently committed to promoting and protecting Indigenous languages and improving the lives of those who speak them. In 2016, the United Nations declared 2019 to be the International Year of Indigenous Languages. At the time, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues said that 40% of the languages spoken around the world were in danger of disappearing, and most of these are Indigenous languages. More recently, in fact yesterday, uh, the Senate made a decision to change its standing orders so that where evidence is given to committees in an Indigenous language, the transcript of that evidence will now be in that language and with a, an English translation. So I can think of no... Ah. <laughs> Um, I, I'd just like to hasten to add that we didn't concoct that to coincide with the lecture, of course, so <laughs> our powers don't go quite that far. Um, but it makes it no better time, of course, to welcome today's speaker um, to talk to us about First Nation languages in the Parliament. Dr Ray Kelly was born and raised in Armidale and belongs to the Tangari and Gumbungir peoples. He now lives and works on a Wabakal country where he's the deputy head of the Centre for Indigenous Education and Research at the University of Newcastle. As well, he's a member of the Aboriginal Community Heritage Advisory Committee in New South Wales. As well as acting, singing, dancing and having his dramatic work produced on the national stage, Dr Kelly has dedicated his working career to the Indigenous community across diverse fields, including arts and culture, health, the environment, and administration. Please join me in welcoming Dr Kelly to the lecture. Thank you for that uh, introduction. I have to now try and live up to it. Um, Ginaga, everybody, Yama. Um, and I'm trying to think of it any other way that I might be able to uh, greet you here today in uh, traditional language, Winyinda, um, um, and many, many other ways. Um, I begin by making this statement. Ngai nere Ray Kelly, ngai tangati, irti irti ngura nganawal ngambiribari, ngai ngata ngata thorday. What this means to me is that my, I introduce myself, Ray Kelly. I belong to the Thangati people and Gumbangi people. I, and in standing today, I say this, this land throughout is Ngunnawal and the place of the Ngambri. I hear this and I understand this. I want to extend my acknowledgement of first people uh, upon this country and I pay my respects to the eldest both past and present. And of course, to all my colleagues and friends here today, I want to say hello and uh, I'm so pleased to see you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you may be aware of the New South Wales Aboriginal Language Bill, which was passed into law in October 2017. It is the first piece of legislation in Australia, now not the only one, uh, the only movement, um, to acknowledge, uh, to, to recognise the significance of first languages, uh, first languages. Since April 2018, the New South Wales Aboriginal Languages Establishment uh, Advisory Group, which I was a part of, uh, represented the interests of language groups across the state. Our role for the ALEG, A ALEAG at the time was to provide guidance and advice to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, Sarah Mitchell, whilst working through the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. This is the first opportunity that I will get to place on record my appreciation for those involved in that group of people, and I want to I want to mention them by name and their uh, their sense and their place of country. Christ Christopher Ingray, uh, representing the Darrell people, Clark Webb from the Gumbangi people, Diane McNabo from Uradri and other groups. Donna McLaren from the Gamilaroi, 
our older brother Gary Williams from the Goombangi, Auntie Irene Harrington from the Bundjalung people, and Auntie, Irene, Auntie Maureen and Rhonda Ashby from the Gamilaroi people. Through the course of our um, uh, gatherings, we, we set about um, trying to determine a pathway for languages in New South Wales uh, in relationship to the arrival of that legislation. But in truth, there are many people who w did not get to see that historical day, who did not get to stand with us and celebrate. There are many great champions of our language revitalisation and renewal efforts who are no longer with us. And for them, I will always be grateful. I recognise today here two, uh, um, two of my colleagues working um, uh, in particular in the um, transcription and writing and uh, the delivery of uh, important resources, uh, John Jukon and of course Ngabu um, Amanda Lissarad. Ngabu means um, slightly older, eh? Yeah. Um, Today, many thousands, many thousands of participants are actively engaged in language revitalisation activities in schools, in community settings, and in their homes. And when I think, of, when I talk about the idea of a parliament, this is the grand house, but of course, a parliament can exist anywhere. And it is that place that I want to draw my, uh, or want to pass my uh, presentation through um, and uh, provide you with my vision for a future where all languages are valued and shared and respected. And it is those gifts that I believe, those genuine gifts, those golden little treasures that exist in every little portion of language that I think is, is the thing that makes me uh, get up and go to work. Now the Aboriginal Languages Act, uh, as it was written or as it was described, seeks to promote, reawaken, nurture and grow Aboriginal languages across the state of New South Wales. The Aboriginal Language Act has three parts. Part one was the preamble which acknowledges the importance of language and the importance of promoting, reawakening and nurturing, nurturing and growing Aboriginal languages and of course Aboriginal custodianships of those languages. Part two is the establishment of the Aboriginal Languages Trust which is currently underway. Um, I'm so pleased to, to say that um, I believe that there will be good financial support and resources to generate uh, language activity amongst, in, uh, amongst its other functions. Part three will be the development of a five-year strategic plan to guide investment and in activities in language activities across New South Wales. I'm so excited about this prospect of drawing people together to have what I call the Great Kipara. In preparing for today's lecture, I reflected on my language journey and it is the, the place in which I start all of my conversations. Back in 2004, I sent out a request to communicate with the author of the Dungati language work, Amanda Lissero. And uh, she's currently working as a senior linguist at uh, IATSIS here in Canberra. At the time, my intention was simply to find additional material for my own cultural outputs. After all, I'm a, I'm a performer, I'm a, I'm a theatre, a thespian, I'm a, uh, uh, I'm a, well, I'm certainly a good talker, I know that much. But that was my intention. Can I get some more material? I need some more material. Uh, we communicated and we gathered and I um, travelled to Walker and Urala. Rocky River, if, to be more specific. And uh, we sat down and we had a conversation. I think I uh, demonstrated my uh, intention to, to be active. And eventually we began a working relationship and I began to 
um, reawaken my own personal sense of language but belonging, my sense of place. And therefore, I think I gathered a sense of purpose as well. I eventually uh, received a copy of the sound files. Uh, the sound files of uh, recorded elders from uh, my community and my, um, my tribal grouping and began a long period of listening that has continued to this day. Over the years I began to translate and I began to hear things that I previously didn't hear. I asked myself on many occasions whether or not I was actually hearing things. Um, I'm comfortable enough to say today that I'm prepared to articulate that on paper and to demonstrate that there are very um, tiny, minute pieces with, uh, embedded within the sound files. But in truth, I wasn't anywhere near prepared to understand the depth and detail contained within these oral tra transmissions. And when I, what I mean by that is that I, I saw the world from a, from a one dimension and these sound files, these oral histories, these, trend, these stories provided another way to look at the world. That is the power of language. Now in my daily return I would uh, listen to these recordings for hours and sometimes all day. I would work through each sentence and I would go through each word and I would look at the sound file and I would even drill down to the smallest sound. In this way I believe that my hearing became more acute. And so there's the um, pathway for my transmissions, uh, for my drafts of the, the language material that I see today. But today's lecture shouldn't, or uh, today's lecture, it is a lecture isn't it, it's a talk. Today's talk should, um, uh, should allow my, myself to use my skills. And so I begin by acknowledging that in the, the, um, the building of this important place, well not this one, but the, the other one which was uh, the, the old parliament out, which was just as important, two elderly men had made the journey to be at this uh, event, um, and I'm sorry, their names: John Clements and Jimmy Clem Clements, and John. That's um, very you know, inappropriate of me. I'll have to come back on that. Let me take you to 1975. We were as children. Uh, young boys been um, taken to um, a number of sites within the Armadale district by senior men. The sites that we'd visited were considered public spaces um, and so uh, the old people felt that it was important that we get a sense of who we were. Um, Uncle Victor Shepherd, who was born in the Baragarang Valley in 1908, was one of those teachers. He married my father's aunt, was living in Armadale at the time of these side visits. Tragically for us, he passed away in 1976. And his passing had a great loss not only for my father and for the people working on the sites of significant survey team, but for all of our communities. I draw your attention to this image of my late father, Raymond Lewis Kelly and Howard, Harry Creamer. And they were recorded at a site called um, Long Gully. And Long Gully is situated very close to the Aboriginal Reserve at Bellbrook.
Long Gully was a pass out ground used in the latter stages of initiations by the Thungati tribe on the, on the mid north coast of New South Wales. It was situated in a place where the ceremonies could be held in private and the very last, what we would consider full initiation happened in 1932. However, in 1979, when this site was declared an Aboriginal place, several men who were a part of that early initiation were still alive and actively sought protection for the site. In this way, these, these men ensured that the knowledge of the site and its importance would be passed on to the younger generations within the Aboriginal community of Bellbrook and those associated families. On the left hand side is a, is a description or a diagram provided my, by my father Raymond Lewis Kelly to the Australian um, Agricultural uh, Archaeological Society in 1975 from his paper From the Kipara to a Cultural Bind. He was arguing at that time about this sense of the material being taken from communities, drawn into the, um, the big research centres where ar archaeologists, anthropologists, psychologists and linguists, I don't know why he put psychologists in there. And he argued that what was happening is that when we were receiving information, it would come via a grapevine. We'd get it through the form of papers or rumours as he described it. But what he was arguing for was a direct feedback. How do you begin to make sure that there is that direct trans, uh, that direct feedback about what is it that you're articulating? What is it that's being captured? And so uh, this led me through my own research and uh, in terms of the way in which I view the language world, I provide a description of the way in which I see the, the language world. I see it as having an ear in both camps and I argue that I am of a, the, I was born in a time when there was still um, a great deal of language around, uh, around us and I consider that I am a crossover speaker. What I mean by a crossover speaker is that I understand nuances that I can hear inside those sound files. I can, understand, I can hear when people are avoiding questions or when people are, are supporting each other to, to fill out stories. But family and community knowledges are important. They're absolutely important in this whole journey going forward. And it is about listening to them old people particularly those that are old and frail now, that need to get those stories um, before them old people pass. And so when I look back to the recordings and the people who had been out on fields, uh, field research and doing that work, I give, I give absolute uh, credence and, and um, I applaud their, their efforts to do that. Where would we be without that material? we would be drawing only from the written description. And so there in it lies an opportunity for us. Storytelling is an important part of that cultural, um, that, that cultural grounding. And I came to understand that there are levels of understanding as well. There are things that I thought I knew as a child that as I got older, I realised that them old people were telling us another story. They were telling us a story for our time, for our age group, age appropriate. And so when I talk about this notion of being multilingual, it's not just about the Aboriginal English or English and then Aboriginal uh, or First uh, Peoples language. In many communities, we share languages across, across those boundaries and borders. You can go into any community and hear Bunjalung being spoken and people know exactly what's going on or if they hear some Goombangi, they know it's Goombangi but they still understand what the words are. 
And in the idea, and the next phase is that academic knowledge is the historical sources, the audio recordings, and the re uh, linguistic reanalysis. For and I, I put this, um, uh, I put this challenge out to to lots of Aboriginal or First Peoples who are interested in language. If you're not satisfied, then get in and do some work. Understand the skill, understand the science of linguistics, understand the, the methods being used. For us, it's not merely about throwing stones, it's about saying, okay, if we're going to get involved, then let's get involved all together. Let's make that conversation broader. Let's make all of those people um, important in the conversation. I want to take you back just briefly to um, 1956, uh, sorry, the mid-1950s. These are the conditions that my family had to live on in Armidale, predominantly Gumbangi and Dangati people. Now, it was a time when, uh, as it's stated there, there were two conflicting attitudes to Aborigines at East Armidale. The Armidale Association for the Assimilation of Aborigines, I just call them AAAA, was formed to help, especially with suitable housing. It was in the latter part of these 1950s that a number of deaths had occurred there due to those conditions. And it was fairly common that a number of people, some members of the Aboriginal Welfare Board that argued that assimilation was not yet possible. Can you believe that? And wanted Aborigines removed to reserves where they would be better educated, disciplined and trained in preparation for assimilation. My mum was removed from this community and indentured to the Aboriginal Protection Board. My grandparents were relocated from Walker in 1937 and taken to Burnt Bridge Mission. Found their way away from there and ended up at La Perouse. At the closing of the La Perouse community and the bulldozing of the shanty town there, where else were they to go but home to Armidale? And so my sense of being a part of Australia during my childhood was a place of alienation. Moving forward to um, 60 and 1961, the, the Aboriginal, Protection, Aboriginal Welfare Board at the time had um, built 14 homes. And so we had become accustomed to the notion of being, to living on the, on the fringe. We called our little community Silver City or the Old Dump. And the Old Dump, um, if you can see the image on the, the top left hand side, the Old Dump existed um, in that background. So the community had not moved very far away from that sense of dread and death. But I suppose it was a new time. Now, during this period, I, well, let's say the late, um, the mid to late 60s, I'd, I'd begun to travel into, into Armidale to, to get an education, to feel a part of, uh, yeah, you know, to, to feel a part, a part of the community. But I understood what it was like, well sorry, I understood what it was like to feel as if I didn't belong or I wasn't welcome. That's not to say that everybody was like that, but there was, a, there was an attitude that those who came from the reserve had come there because we simply saw the opportunity to get houses. Um, I reflect on a conversation that I've had with people around trying to bring together the right words to describe our people. Now, we call ourselves Guri, but some people, when I was a child, we were Aborigines. Then we became Aboriginal at some point, 1974, 75. Now we're called Indigenous. We're struggling or we're arguing to be called First Peoples, First Nations, 
And I look forward to the time when we can come to, together and go, OK, that's the appropriate language now. But people make language up all the time, I suppose. It was this period of time when I looked to, the, when I looked to this image on the right. This is my great-grandfather, Frank Archibald, born in uh, 1982 and died in 1975. He was 14 years of age. I was 14 years of age when he passed. He was an old man and um, he was um, crippled with arthritis um, and uh, to some degree his, um, I recall that his memory was going. But we had these stories about this grand great-grandfather of his, Malawangi, or Robert King of the Gumbutha Gang. And we thought we understood, you know, if, if you're a child and your only view of, of Aboriginal culture is externally from your community is through a book and you look to see what that image is and you don't feel connected to it, then I understand what it feels like to be at, an on, at, a, at, a, at a loss. So we get this image and we, and we look at this story and, and we see this grand, grand man Robert, and my grandfather talks about a time uh, and did talk about a time when, when our people were of a different status or of a different standing. I want to take you to the IATSIS website now or parts of it that I've taken. And for me, this is the most important space for Aboriginal languages outside the home or outside the school. Um, I hope that this um, description is right. There's approximately four, four, 400, uh, 40,000 hours of audios, most of which is unique and unpublished. The recordings document Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, ceremonies, music and oral histories and also include a small number of copies of significant historical recordings held here and overseas, interstate libraries, but here is a powerful space in which to, to begin to start to work and to recover language and to recover a sense of belonging to country. Those sound files, along with Amanda's teaching earlier, those earlier guides, have been invaluable to my sense of connection to country. And I'm sure that when, and if others begin to do the same type of research that I've been doing, I think there, there could be a great time for all of us. Um, some documentation, number of people involved. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the two sisters standing with Amanda here. Um, Caroline, who is currently um, still working out of Kempsey. And, um, and our late art. I'll simply leave it at that. So we've been doing some good work. But in truth, we're having trouble in our communities because there is this mistrust. There is mistrust amongst, amongst us because there is this sense of, because of this other word, this word about native title. And I'm told, and I, I read from, um, I read from the um, lecture of Mick Dodson about this issue about native title. It has become a very divisive a aspect, I think, in our communities. And whilst I up, uphold and believe that it's important that the, we, as a country, move forward and find proper ways to deal with that dispossession and displacement. There is lots of work for us to do and we can't do that if we're telling people you can't come into the space, if we're telling people what you've got to say isn't important, if we're telling people that you're talking nonsense. I'll take you back very quickly to, to Long Gully. My father said that when he was retiring that he would write his memoirs. 
Sadly, three months into his uh, three months into his retirement, he had a major stroke and never got to write those memoirs. But I know the stories, and I'll give you the story here today. That Long Gully, the event in Long Gully, was staged and was ready to go, but we didn't have the grunder. We didn't have the senior man who would um, obviously um, carry, um, the, carry the, the whole process through, who knew all of those other bits and pieces. And so they had, the number is nearly 60 people, 60 young men in place waiting the arrival of the Grunda. Somebody got message that to, to the group that he couldn't come for whatever reason. And so they sat for a day or two, the old men, or the older men in that group, and decided that they would have what they call a kippar. They sat together and communicated about what should happen. I'm told that nobody had a name in those conversations. It was impolite to say, Bill should do it, John should do it. There was a protocol that required you to offer up a suggestion without name. And so the story goes, as my father um, gave it to us, somebody in the circle said, I know somebody who knows some of them songs. And a pause was had and then they waited and then somebody said, if somebody gives somebody a hand, somebody thinks somebody can do it. And so the kippara in that time occurred and was carried through. Now, as my father explained to me, it might have been more contemporary, but isn't that what culture's about? Isn't, isn't that what culture does? You know, you change, you adapt, you move. You bring the best of what you know, but you make it new. I'm so very pleased uh, to think about my father because he was a very strong and open uh, gentleman around this notion of cultural um, material. For him, lots of, material, lots of the material wasn't off limits. And today, I'm sorry, but when people are telling us that it's men's business and women's business. I understand when there's a difference. I understand clearly when there's a difference. But when somebody looks at a, a, a description historically and say that's men's business, that women's business, doesn't make sense to me. If it's, if it's, good, if it's for the good of the community or for the good of the, the, the people, then surely it belongs to all of us. Maybe we meet, need to be a little bit sophisticated about how we communicate with each other. Here's the day of the uh, standing on Parliament House, and I had a chance to talk on the floor on that day. And much like the day I, I bring notes, but I tend to want to talk from the heart. And that's not a play on words from talk for the heart, but people can take that how they like. And we stood in that group together. We look quite nice in our uh, in our possum and kangaroo skins. Now that wasn't structured. Somebody came along with a, with a, a box full of um, skins and we just looked at them and said, you know, we all should wear one. And we did. Well, for those, there was enough to go around for a number of us. And we did. We stood in a circle or a semicircle and we allowed each person in that grouping to say what they needed to say. We knew that it, our time was short, but we never said what we have to say is this. Everybody spoke. And the support by parliamentarians and, and the, the leaders of government on that day was astronomical. It was fantastic. It was brilliant. It was, it was such an uplifting day. 
Okay, so we've got the legislation, but where to from here? If we think that it is merely just about, you know, learning older language, then we're in trouble. Now, some community groups around the state are doing exceptional things. I understand they can count to a thousand in some groups. Fantastic. But that's the job, that's the job that we have to be involved in. <clears throat> and as I said, we share that responsibility. So in terms of the New South Wales Aboriginal Languages Trust, there has to be this relationship built with all parties, not just Aboriginal, but there are other groups of people who are important in the journey. Like my father's description, it is the, um, the linguist and the archeologist and the anthropologist. And I suppose we'll throw in a couple of psychologists too. But that's the place for all of us. So when I talk about the parliament, I really talk about a kipara. This is probably the, seen as the big kipara, but that's what I talk about. That's what I think about, where each and everybody's opinion is valued and is able to be shared with, uh, with respect. And as my father would say, that's what we need to do. We need to sit down and we need to thrash it out old description, old language, but I understand that what he was saying, we need to work together. We need to find the common ground to build the type of service, pro uh, the type of language programs that can bring about health and wellbeing, that can bring about visions for a higher education. And that for me is my sense of creating that pathway forward. I want to be involved in that. I want to be a part of that cultural change. I want to be there, and I don't have to be involved, I don't have to be the leader. I realise today that I can take a, my part in that kippara just like them older gentlemen back in that time. I can sit and I can wait. I can support those young people. I can advise them. Certainly don't make the mistakes that I've made. But don't restrict yourself either. Reach, reach beyond what you can literally touch. I want to finish with this piece. This is a recording by John Gordon, and it's my great grandfather, Frank Archibald, and it was a recording in 1968. Field tape 16, item 19. John Gordon on the 26th of August 1968 speaking to Mr. Frank Archibald and his wife of East Armadale. Mr. Archibald is 84 and has lived in the area all his life. He sings two songs in Gumbinga. The first was written by his grandfather to commemorate the arrival of the first train in Armadale. The second concerns the Salvation Army. Remis reminiscences continue onto the next tape, number 17. Um, well, Mr. Archibald, I believe you're going to sing us a railway song. Uh, wh wh when was the occasion? Ah, uh, when the opening of the railway in the town. Yes. And uh, how long ago was this? Oh, I suppose it's when the first train came, came to Armour. Mm -hmm. How long that be? It'd be close to about a hundred years ago, I suppose. So the song and brief will be about. Uh, a hundred years old, yeah. and uh, you've lived in this area most of your life? Yeah, born here. And that would be about oh, 80, 84 years. 84 years ago. Oh, well, this is a, a real historical song. <laughs> Thanks. That's it. It's only a little short song, but that mm. the bell, 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 it says that's when the boy rang the bell for let the train go through, you see. Very good. He said, in the wheel, the wangleji, that's the wheel that's going round in the train. Yes. And wang, wangleji, wangle, the government go. He said, the government has gone through to up the line further. Mm -hmm. 
And what language is this in? Goombanga. Goombanga. Yeah. Mr. Archibald, I believe your grandfather made that song up. Yes, he did at the railway station in Armadale. Mm -hmm. They built a hatch for him across from the railway station, across from the, across the line, right? Yes. And he was on the top of this, he stood on the top while the, while the train went underneath. He, he opened the... Mum, shut up, boss. He, he opened the Armadale Railway. Yes, yes. He was the first man to yes. open the railway. And uh, you said something about some of the words meant the train was puffing. Yes, that's it. Which uh, did you? He said, "Not even good John, see? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's yeah. the it, it, that's the engine. And they, they, those words, do they mean anything, or are they just imitative sound? Yes, means that the train was puffing and it went past the engine was puffing. Not even good be John, see? Good be John. You know, over the train going, yes. you hear the train sometimes going, good be John, good be John. Yes. Well, that's the best word you could get. Not even good be John. He said that thing was going good be John like that. Yes. That means the train was passing. The train was passing. Thank you. Right. And so my final words will be this. I think that my language work has improved because I've made it a daily exercise. I've tried desperately to, to share it with so many people. But I work in a little language um, group to, at the moment, my, my children and my grandchildren. Very excited. Um, and this, this constant work, <clears throat> I think, helps my language work. <clears throat> I think one of the greatest gifts that we have to understand the potential relationship outside of our own space has been the NITV group. I'm so pleased when I hear people talking language from other parts of the, the country. And I go, hey, I wonder, hey, that sounds like... Now, of course, that, that work needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be expanded if we're ever going to get into that. But I think there is great potential for all of us. I'm going to leave it on that, I think. I'm... So we have some time for a few questions, but first, thank you very much. It's wonderful. <laughs> So we've got microphones, one in the gallery and two on the floor, if there's anyone who would like to kick us off with a question for Dr Kelly. I'm going to jump in if there isn't. Yes, come, come to the microphone for us though, because it's quite hard for the people in the gallery otherwise to... This one? Yes. I just yeah. wanted to share something with the audience. Um, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, the haphazard nature of survival of language. When you think about um, everything Ray's been talking about today, um, very quickly summarise, I read an economic hi history of the valley. I never thought I'd read an economic history of anything. But um, because of the nature of the valley, there were a lot of work camps. And people from the Bellbrook Mission, the men and the families used to go up the valley and work for their landowners, um, clearing the land, building the fences, running the cattle, doing all the work. And uh, that's, you know, incorporates one of the last Gipara ceremonies and also the survival of the language because while they were up there in family groups, being left alone to get, a get on with the work, what did they speak in? Not English. They were using Dungari to communicate. And so part of the reason for the survival of the language into the 60s and 70s um, uh, is because of that and also but part of the interference happened when people came back from white fellows came back from World War II um, they needed work and so they started to break up the farms into smaller farms and who got the work the white fellows and so the work started to dry up but just jumping back into 1930 um, the Aboriginal Protection Board wanted to move the Bellbrook Mission to Old Bar, from Burn memory? Burnbridge. Burn, well, to Old Bar as I well. Think that, I think ultimately they were going to move them all to one place and make another Sherberg. Yeah, experiment. so um, if... But yes, you're right, it actually was Old Bar. Old Bar, down, which is down near Taree in um, Birupai country. So another language group. Um, many of, you know, there were lots and lots of relationships, but um, they wanted to move Dungari people out of Dungari country. And the reason that didn't happen was because the white 
landowners said, no, 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 that's our workforce, they're not going anywhere. So this is really haphazard stuff. Um, and, you know, other haphazard incidents like particular people coming through, Niels um, Gerhard Larvis in 1929, he was the first trained linguist in Australia. So his written records are really useful because they're written in phonetic script, so you don't have to interpret them as you do when you find things written through English script. Um, and just, you know, haphazard events like that. Um, various um, linguists or academics or, ha you know, what we call hacker linguists. Um, it's all just um, quite frightening when you find this material and realise that it's the language survived through the strength of the people and these, um, you know, situations like not moving to Old Bar, where people would have used English a lot sooner and a lot more often. So I just wanted to share that with the audience. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm just, uh, I would absolutely um, um, support what Amanda's saying there, that the language did survive in its, um, in its form um, um, because of that ability to, to be in that space. Now, of course, this is still part of what they call the, uh, the falls country, where lots of people were forced and pushed into where, um, and there are many stories about um, um, not just uh, massacres in that space, but uh, you know, what people consider guerrilla warfare, but uh, our people were not, merely, uh, were, were, were not merely hiding there as well. They, so, uh, so I suppose that at some point there was this relationship built with um, you know, uh, sincere, um, genuine uh, landowners who, uh, um, because prior to the Aboriginal Protection Board, we were landowners as well. We owned the land at Bellbrook. It was, it was not something pulled apart for by the uh, Protection Board. So in, in fact, we were a part of that. Um, we were part of that developing economy. And so when I look to this, when I look to this historical truth, it is the invention of the Aboriginal Protection Board and the power that it wielded that took people away from an economic independence. And so when you lose that independence, I think you also lose a sense of yourself to some degree, you know. But I, you know, that power and will to survive is, is still very much a part of our, 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 our sense of being today. Mm. Further questions? We might have one. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ray. My name's John Jacon. I um, actually work in Gamilaroi, Uwalarai, which is Maori area. Um, one of the comments you made was um, you said the challenge is to people to get in there and do some of the work, like, you know, Indigenous people. I guess one of my senses has been that neither the federal government nor the state government has been actively working to get uh, Indigenous people, First Nations people trained in linguistics. Now people like yourself have gone out, very few people like yourself have gone out and done it. Um, and so what I'm seeing in Gamilaroi Yualarai is people using language at a very basic level because they don't understand a whole lot of the features of the old language. So I guess mm. I, my question is since we're in Parliament, um, what do you see or do you want to make some comment about Parliament making it easier for Aboriginal people, Indigenous, First Nations people to get involved in the, the sort of heavy duty linguistics which is a, a real part of this. Mm. Yes, and thanks John. And, and, and to that end, I, I absolutely believe that it's critical that both the federal and state uh, agencies and governments um, and territory governments, that they invest in that, um, uh, uh, that endeavour. It is about and it, it isn't merely just about creating a, um, a new language space. It's about, it's about the inquiry. It's about the conversation. And you know full well, John, um, what it's like to... Uh, and today I share the same... I, I receive the same um, attention at times. People say, well, where do you get that from? How did you make that assumption? You know? But it's based on a science. There is a, there is a heavy duty um, process that you can go through. Now, I couldn't have got there unless I had a pathway 
and Amanda became my pathway in the earlier part. But I couldn't have got there without, without the will to want to understand. Now, I don't in any way um, say that I know everything. What I say is that I have, I have something to offer and it's about sharing that offering with each other. And I think when we're looking towards, when we look across the state and certainly across the country, if we can invest in that, um, that endeavour, a linguistic model, uh, linguistic training, then you can, I believe the opportunity, I, I reckon, I believe the language will move quicklier. It will m move more fluidly when people believe that, or people agree that, you know, I think they'll feel more confident. But it's a real challenge. Yes, there's a question up the back. I'm just wondering if for uh, employment purposes and a whole lot of other things, if the, 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 the um, spreading out of learning the different languages, um, it could be um, associated with tourism and eco-tourism, so, you know, Indigenous kids, for instance, could say, well, I can become, you know, a tour guide and all associated with that was so everybody got to, you know, could, could learn the language that way. So, mm. because, you know, Australia is unique that way and people from overseas don't want to come and see another little America. So, it's something that mm. you might want to just take on board. Um, in 1975, uh, Raymond Lewis Kelly uh, and uh, the people from the site survey team were thinking exactly that that here is, a, here is an opportunity in the future. Now, we only need to see that the, um, the tourism opportunities in the national parks in, in, um, in New South Wales and elsewhere in the country, that there is a, there is a place for, this, for future employment. Yeah. But for me, it's about talking about country. When people can talk to country genuinely from the heart and go, I understand what this story is about. That story is not my story, but... And, and so you can actually take people into um, a cultural learning, uh, you know, apart from the, you know, the vista and the, the beauty of the country, you can, you can find a way to help embed them, if you like, in, in country. Yes, and that, I could think be, it's, I mean, that could be incorporated with food and, you know, absolutely. You know teaching how to cook and traditional ways and herbs and all sorts of yeah. things, you know. So there is this powerful moving, movement at the moment. Yeah. There is a powerful movement at the moment where people are, um, um, uh, actively involved in weaving, and and you would think, well, weaving it's a pastime, isn't it? No, no. The, the, what I'm hearing is that there are groups of women who are sitting down, talking about business, while using their hands, talking about those issues in their community whilst using their hands, talking about the aspirations and visions for their kids whilst using their hands, talking about the behaviour of community members whilst using their hands. So here is a practical way that we can do this. We're, we're now seeing lots and lots of other groups involved in taking young men, like 1975 in the description I showed you, taking young men back out into country, but taking them away, unfortunately, from the digital space. Um, see, I think, it's a I think the digital space is a great space, mm. but unless it's harnessed, unless, unless people are uh, are, are, you know, educated about its use, because there is a really downside to this digital space. You can, you can grab anything at the at a, at an instant, and people can be exposed to stuff that just isn't healthy. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about how do we build that healthy space? And for me, that's what that's what the governments can invest in. If you're going to invest in in, if you're going to invest in in language and culture and heritage, then we need to, we need a place where it's going to be safe. Um, I'm uh, I'm a lecturer at university, and I and I say to my students, you know, you need to be you need to be following the the reference groups of where the the sites that we're giving you. Don't just draw from these others because we don't know what's there. Well, sometimes we do, and we go, hmm, that's old material, or it's. It's not, um, it's not considered appropriate today. So for me, I, I think it's an important thing for, for us to, to th conceptualise what that might be. Mm. No. Um, look, I think it's been an incredibly thoughtful and a very personal lecture that you've taken us through and, and um, I think we really appreciate that. I think um, towards the middle you said 
that languages provide another way of looking at the world and that, that's the power of language. And I think um, we would all agree, certainly from the reaction earlier, that parliaments are a place where we should hear those different views of the world. And um, I think you've left us with a lot to, to take away mm. and, and um, ruminate on. So right. thank you very much, Dr Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.